Um, sure, yeah. So, oh, recording progress. All right. So, thank you. Um, so, I, I'm from Toronto and I've been doing mostly kind of web dev uh, and uh, and startups and mostly it's been my, com my, my company with a few other co-founders and so we've spent the last several years just in Clojure which has been nice because we, we get to decide what we use and so we stick with Clojure um, but before that it was like Ruby uh, JavaScript like the very beginnings of Node but uh, not a lot of that but it was mostly yeah uh, kind of early Ruby and JavaScript um, but mostly Clojure and so today uh, I'll be talking about uh, data-oriented programming, and let me kick up my slideshow here. And let's share a screen. There. there we go. Everyone can see. Yeah. Um, and um, right. So, data-oriented pro programming is a term that it gets kind of thrown about in in the closure community. And as these sort of like new fangled ideas uh, kind of as they go, it's not very well defined. Um, you know, it, it's something where, you know, if you asked a bunch of closure developers, they'd give you a bunch of different answers for it, but you know, all of them would probably know it when they saw it. And so uh, this talk today is my attempt at kind of taking the zeitgeist of the community and the practices and the way that we throw around these terms and trying to explain it to a crowd that is fortunately not very closure um, uh, heavy. So uh, this is good. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to feedback or questions about well, how, how can you possibly be doing this or how does this work or how can you, you know, not be using types or, or any of that kind of stuff. I uh, definitely want some pushback because I am you know, I'm going to try to describe these various ideas in an unbiased way, or at least kind of just like be just neutral about it. I'm not trying to sell you on uh, these practices, but because I'm, you know, uh, in, a, in a bubble, I, um, I, I know that I'm likely going to come off as very biased. And so I'm looking for some discussion after and, and, and questions. And again, this, this will try to, this will, this will be a bit reductionist probably. And I kind of think of it as an exercise in like programming anthropology. It's like, what, what are these, you know, here we see the uh, closure programmers of the natural habitat doing these weird things that maybe no one else is doing, or maybe other people are doing, we'll see. And so this term data-oriented programming, and, and, and some people might say, well, is it data-oriented programming or is it data-driven programming? Because both of those terms get um, mentioned quite a lot in the, in the closure community. And it's actually today I'm going to cover both because they used to be uh, kind of used somewhat interchangeably. But I think, and you know, I, I, I gave a talk like two two years ago when and I was using them interchangeably. But there's a bit more clarity now, and people kind of use them to refer to slightly different things. And so we're going to do a talk of two parts where we're going to talk about data orientedness and data drivenness, and um, we'll see how they're you know they're very related. Um, but also kind of used in slightly different ways. And so the, the plan is going to be that I'm going to, I'm going to talk about one of them for, I don't know, 20 minutes and then do questions, Q and A, um, and then maybe take a break. And then we'll talk about the other one, uh, data driven programming, and then follow that up with some questions and Q and A. And so I'm going to kind of get going by just trying to give you the two definitions so that you have something to anchor to and then we'll dive in deeper. So both of these, um, let's talk about kind of data oriented programming. And I would kind of in a, in a sentence kind of explain it as try, is the choice of using generic data structures and preferring them to objects and typed records. So using kind of the most generic um, uh, plain data representations as we can in preference to, to objects and type records, even if we have them available and using them throughout the program. Uh, so another way of maybe saying this and that might be kind of semi-universal would be imagine if we just 
passed JSON objects around everywhere in our programs. So we didn't use fancy classes or types. We just had kind of JSON. Now, in Clojure, it's not actually JSON. And it's not like JSON as a string, but I mean like the stuff that you could put in JSON in terms of you know arrays, um, keys and values, numbers, strings, that kind of stuff. Um, and just trying to pass off like these simple objects. Um, JavaScript calls them objects. It's terrible. Uh, they're just hash maps and you know arrays. So passing off, passing around just these, these simple things around everywhere in our programs. And then data-driven programming is the term that uh, Clojure devs tend to use to refer to um, also what I kind of think is a, is a choice or a preference where, again, we prefer using kind of these generic data structures um, instead of writing code in situations that we can get away with that. And, um, and that might be interesting, like how can we just use data structures instead of code and we'll kind of see that, but there are, there are cases where we, we can basically do some meta programming, um, put stuff into just data structures and then derive functionality from it. And data-driven programming is like choosing that over writing you know, macros or functions or objects or, or, or whatever. And it's particularly used for like, creating uh, DSLs, so domain specific, like little sub languages. And my, my kind of quick, quick universal way of describing that is what if we used JSON as the DSL to everything? Like what if you know, we needed to write some regex? What if it was in JSON? Um, what if we, if we needed to talk to and from our database? So instead of writing select statements in SQL, what if we represented them as JSON? Now again, not really JSON, but it's it's kind of it gets the idea across of like what if we had this we use these like um, very generic fundamental um, simple data structures as the primary interface and that it's data it doesn't have any behavior it's just plain data um, as the interface of these things so those are the the two ideas we'll be going a little bit deeper into um, I'll mention that there is a term that's also like in in the video game C plus C uh, community, they have a term also called data oriented design or data oriented programming design. And it's a little, it's, it's completely different in, in there. And from my understanding, it's more about how like they, uh, it's the architect their applications very fundamentally around like, where's the data coming from? And like, you know, how do we get data from the graphics card to the memory caches? Like it's, it's purely like, you know, uh, optimizing around the data flows of piping, you know, pixels around. Um, and so that's not what we're, uh, we're not what we're talking about. It's a different kind of data flow. Um, cool. So those are going to be our two topics. Any questions before uh, I dive into the first one? I do. I have a question. Sure. So when when you're talking about uh, generic data structures and you're saying, okay, it's JSON, but also like, it's not really JSON. It's just the stuff you can put into JSON. Um, is that, what is the difference between that and what, you know, Ruby and JavaScript are doing, you know, just, or even Clojure, I guess, because it isn't that a dynamic language as well. Yeah. So I guess I, I say, um, you know, in Ruby, you have hash maps, but you mm. also have objects and you have classes and objects. And 90% okay. of Ruby programmers will create classes and objects for everything. If they need to create a user, they will create oh. a user class and put okay. data into a user class, even though they could just make a hash map with a, you know, a name and then email as keys. I see. So, so that, so in that case, so yeah, the generic, and, and I'll, and I'll kind of, you know, I'll, I'll show the closure ones, but it's, it's kind of, you know, in Clojure, it's possible to create um, classes and and uh, like objects, proper proper like Java objects, and it's and they also have a type called a record, which isn't the Java records because it was Clojure had them before Java had them, but they basically implement kind of like you know uh, structs. Um, mm -hmm. okay. But it's the choice of not using those and trying okay. to be kind of at a lower common denominator. And uh, yeah, and so we'll go okay. we'll go in deeper into that. Um, but it's a good question. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you. 
Um, can I can I ask um, how much of this is about sort of closure and closure culture versus lisp? Um, I, yeah, I think it could very well be a lisp thing as well. Um, the interesting bit, I guess, even in closure culture, is that like I think there are there are some distinctions from you know my you know I. I I only see it from from having really only joined the Lisp community via Clojure, but even at the beginning of Clojure, the practices like in the, you know Clojure is like ten or ten to twelve years old, and the the way that people were writing Clojure code ten to twelve years ago was very different, and it was uh, very macro heavy, and um, and or very like protocols object heavy. Um, and it kind of migrated towards these things that we're, I'm going to be talking about today. And so my understanding is that like, yes, I guess like, you could be doing this in other languages. And, and I will kind of try, try, try to kind of talk about like, okay, what does a language need to be able to do this kind of stuff well? And so, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be closure. It's just something that we talk about in, in, uh, in, in closure. And I think there are features of closure that make this, the, both of these kinds of practices very easy. And that's why they're done. Um, but yeah, things like you know, uh, I think people, you know, closure programmers use the least amount of macros of Lisp programmers. My understanding is that like common Lispers just like love macros, um, and whereas there's a like a strong cultural vibe of like, uh, you know, there, there's the joke of like what is you know the, what, the first rule of macro club is don't write macros, um, and you try to like I have you know over the last ten years of full time closure development have written maybe three macros. Um, in my in in my in my yeah, in my work. So I have I have one more uh, question. So I was wondering about um, when you say generic data structure. Is generic doing any work there? Like, are you talking about you know generics with a capital G, or you do you just mean like the primitive types? Yeah, I, it's. I mean, I think it, the the capital G generic does is kind of related, but no, it is kind of more just like the primitive types. Okay. I, in closure, we would just call these we, we we call it plain data, but I just feel okay. like it's it's a it, like what does plain data mean? But yeah, I will definitely yeah. go. Uh, my first thing actually, the next like, as we go into oh, it is okay. kind of trying to describe like what is what do I mean by uh, generics okay. uh, or generic data structures? Um, any anything else before we continue? Um, Cool. Yeah, let's dive in. I'm sure there will be lots of new things uh, to, to chat about. OK, so data-oriented programming. Um, Clojure as a language, you know, every language makes a lot of choices around you know, things it does and things it doesn't do, things it makes easy and things it makes hard. And of all the various ch choices that Clojure made, there are kind of two that are relevant to the conversation today. And they're quite, you know, quite strong choices. Um, given the ecosystem. And one of them is like, you know, this choice of like preferring functions to objects and being a functional programming language. Um, and the other one that also is quite divisive is, you know, the dynamic typing um, versus static typing, um, not having to, you know, uh, type uh, like, you know, it's, you, writing a whole bunch of types and typing out every type of object you create instead um, yeah dynamic typing is, is, is a very different um, uh, experience and it's kind of particularly interesting because you know closure started off as being on uh, on the JVM right it's hosted by the JVM and Java is kind of the opposite of these Java is one of the kind of classically heavily object oriented languages and it's strictly typed. Um, and so, and Clojure can interoperate with Java. And so we can do all those, like in Clojure, you can do all those things. And I kind of, as I mentioned, data-oriented programming is about, you know, we can do these things, but we've, we're choosing not to. And we're choosing to kind of, um, yeah, default to using kind of these generic data structures. And so kind of let, let's kind of clarify what, the, what I mean. And I've been using generic data structures, which is kind of just my, my word for this right now. Um, in Clojure, we would 
you know, a lot of people just talk about plain data, plain data, but, you know, there's lots of different kinds of data. Everything is data. If and so the like, you know, JSON is a string that you have to parse. So I mean, like what you would get if you parsed some JSON, like the, the in, um, whoops, the in, uh, in memory kind of representation. Is, uh, am, am I okay? Because I, I had like an internet warning. Is it like a connection warning? Things are okay still? Yeah, you broke up for a second, but. Okay, I'm back? Fine. Okay. Um, so when I'm talking about like generic data structures, it is this idea of kind of using the very fundamental primitives uh, and using them throughout the application. And in Clojure's case, well, here's kind of an example, you know, that's things like hash maps. Um, lists and array and vectors, which are kind of like arrays, uh, closure that also includes sets, um, all various kinds of numbers, you know, the integers, floats, um, at, with various ways of representing precision. Closure also has ratios, uh, UUIDs, ints, instants, strings, of course. And in closure's case, there's keywords as well as namespaced keywords. Um, so you can have keywords, but you can also namespace those keywords. And uh, keywords are in some languages called symbols, uh, but Clojure has both keywords and symbols. Uh, symbols are kind of what are you know the you know function names and uh, 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 references to their variable names. Those are symbols, and keywords are these things with colons in front of them. Um, and so. Uh, part of the idea of data-oriented programming is let's just pass this kind of stuff around as we're seeing kind of just like these user record objects. They're not necessarily typed. Um, but so they're, well, they aren't typed, but like the, um, we would just kind of say, well, this is just a hash map with these keys and values. And in theory, you know, we could add or remove keys and values to it willy-nilly. In Clojure, you can put anything as a key. It doesn't have to be a keyword like I've done here. You could have strings, you can have numbers, but let's just use these fundamental kind of primitives uh, rather than creating kind of strict typed various kinds of objects and um, yeah, lean into kind of using these primitives and have them everywhere in our application. And when I mean everywhere, it's kind of just like default to using it everywhere. So for example, for our HTTP stack, there's a spec called ring um, enclosure and it takes whatever HTTP request you get and represents it as an object. Well, as, as this hash map, uh, which is this like plain data, then you you know that gets passed into whatever function that you know your your implementation of what your web server is doing, and then you as the programmer also then just return plain data to the the you know the web server the, that's implementing the HTTP stuff, and that gets converted to an actual response. Now, if you've done Ruby before, this looks kind of uh, normal. Um, in JavaScript, it's almost like this, except you know a lot of their things, you have to like modify it. You receive a request object. Sometimes you have to call methods on it to extract stuff out of it. And if you wanna respond to something, you have to call methods on a response object and do some stuff. Whereas in Clojure, they've kind of chosen to just have this kind of abstraction. You just get this object in, do some stuff and you oh, hash map in. Uh, do some stuff and return a hash map out. And it's the same idea for like databases. If you want to, uh, most of the database libraries just have you pass in something like this and spit. And if you query stuff, you get an array of things like this out of it. And so it's this practice generally of just like having these kinds of uh, primitive hash maps that aren't typed. It's not a database response object. It is just the same thing um, it's just a hash map with a bunch of keys and values. Does that kind of clarify what or what I'm talking about when I'm talking about plain data? Or do you have any uh, more kind of questions around what that is versus like not being plain data? So, so is the idea something like, like we're just going DTO all the way? What's a DTO? A data transfer object. So the, yeah, I, I don't. I'm not familiar with that term, but um, I guess if 
uh, so these would be uh, these objects that are like um, I guess composed of these primitives uh, that that you you put them sort of at the edges of programs. So you send them out over HTTP or send them to and from the database, and then you know internally you would have you know sort of sh um, stronger types, perhaps. Okay, so yeah, so so perhaps, but in closure in data oriented programming, we'd say you don't need the you don't necessarily need the stronger types. Um, you right. So okay. This would be done. Yeah, I guess in this example, I try to say like this is just for communicating with outside things. No, you would pass it between functions. You would do it like everywhere throughout your application. Okay. Um, you would uh, basically avoid uh, actual typed objects. Now, okay. We do have certain practices um, that I'll get to in terms of like you know, uh, there's probably you know alarm bells going off of like in your heads of like how is this kind of feasible or how do you write correct programs in a, in a, in a reasonable way? And, and I'll get to that. Um, but it's basically it's the idea of like just using these sorts of things just everywhere um, internally uh, as a way of communicating with outside things. I mean, depending on what you're communicating with outside, you might have to like convert it to JSON or convert it to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. photo buffers or whatever, but internally, just like between functions, between different parts of the internal application. Yeah. Just sending these sorts of things around. Okay. Um, and you know this, the, you know this kind of uh, given what we have to work with in in closure, which is it is much richer than what you know JSON or or even JavaScript objects give us because like um, you know there are literals for dates, there are literals for UUIDs. There are much more kind of there, there's more there are more primitive types than than uh, you know something like JavaScript objects have and like JavaScript. All keys are strings in, in closure, you know, it maintains the type of the thing that's used in the key and the value. Like it's 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 a it's a bit better, but it is quite similar to this idea of just like passing these like very simple like JavaScript objects around or very Ruby hash maps. Um, and I kind of think of it as uh, another way of thinking of data-oriented programming is we choose this kind of plain data to be the kind of lingua franca. Of information in our programs, and and we're we're kind of uh, we're willing to uh, sacrifice some of the benefits of perhaps doing things with string objects or typed structs and things like that, um, because this is kind of a lower common denominator, and then we might get some benefits by trying to lean into it this way. Um, and just kind of how like in you know the idea of a lingua franca is you know you have people that are capable of talking various languages, but they kind of settle on this like pidgin language that is the lowest common denominator. And there's kind of benefits that come from scale from having settled on that. Um, and then that, that kind of tends to grow and, and there's kind of yeah, benefits from uh, doing this wholesale. And getting to those benefits, really the, the reason for it, I think, or at least the, uh, the argument for why this is um, beneficial is that by using these kind of generic data structures, you get access to all of the functions in closure and libraries and whatever, but, but, but the closure standard library is very strong in terms of working with these kinds of data structures. And so you get access to, ton, all, to that and you can use them anytime, anywhere you have data. Um, you don't, so instead of having like specific access and having you know every type of object having to have its own functions to get stuff in and out of it. Um, you have generic functions to work on these generic op, you know, generic objects. I mean I shouldn't call them like generic data structures. And you also so not only so you have access to these you know this gigantic awesome co collection of um, of standard library, but also you then have the freedom to manipulate that data in whatever way. You wanna just like temporarily merge two, th you know, these two hash maps together, that's fine. You wanna do a diff, that's fine. You wanna just extract some, just the keys, that's fine. Or just the values, that's fine. You wanna like, um, uh, you know, uh, intermix, like you, if you, you have a bunch of, you know, an array of numbers, an array of other things, an array of strings, and you wanna, stitch them together into a map, 
that's fine. Um, because it's all the same kind of stuff. You've chosen to kind of settle on this common soup of, of stuff. Um, I kind of think of it like, if you look at like a typed object, you know, it's hard, like how do you get the methods of it? You know, maybe there's some metaprogramming availability and, but usually it's slow and, and not typically used very often unless you're like, you know, in Ruby and doing a ton of metaprogramming or you're writing rails and then, you know, the, the internals of rails just uh, really rely on the Ruby met metaprogramming abilities. But yeah, getting the methods of an object, getting all the values of an object, um, or if you want to just like have an object with a subset of these methods and pass it off somewhere else, well, if it's an object oriented programming language, you're going to have to probably create a new type so that you can this subsetted type and pass it off somewhere else. Merging things together, diffing, doing kind of a temporary mashup of things inside of a reduced statements. There's a freedom to the kind of to this approach, but it does of course come with trade-offs. You know, and the trade-offs are basically everything that you would get with being able to kind of have static, strict defined types of things. And that includes things from my, at least from my perspective, and I'd love to hear uh, the point of view of uh, people who use type languages. Because um, I think from both sides of the table, it's kind of like, how could you, you know, if someone who works with types is like, how could you possibly live without types? And on my side is like, how could you possibly kind of get things done with types? Um, because you know, in, in in the closure community, there's this kind of idea that oh, you know, with type languages, you have to spend all your time just like fighting the type system. And I I want to hear your thoughts on that later. But I do agree, and I did definitely as a closure developer, I know that part of the trade-off is you know, typing helps in terms of documentation. Like it is a you know self-documenting in terms of what things are in the system, and I can look to a place and see okay, this kind of object, what can I expect about it? Um, if I'm trying to just like do validation in very various places in my application, that could be useful, or just like have general correctness throughout my program and make sure that I don't accidentally, you know, pass this function a half, you know, half broken object because it's missing some keys or values, um, and also uh, just like the general things like the the things that an IDE, a good IDE can do, like JetBrains uh, is pretty fantastic. Um, because of the type system and it's able to kind of infer a lot of things like give you auto completion, refactoring support, compile time, correctness checks. Like there's a lot of awesome stuff and some of it, you know, all of these things, all these trade-offs I'm, I'm saying, there are approaches to an enclosure. Like there are some libraries that do introduce some static type checking. They're not like as 100% comprehensive as you would get in something like Haskell because the, there are certain things that you know, are ambiguous and therefore can't be determined because we have dynamic uh, uh, typing in the language. Um, and for, you know, we're talking about this idea of self-documentation and, and, and validation. Closure, there are libraries that help you write what we call specs. So you could choose effectively when you want to check at runtime uh, various things. And so, you know, in most of our systems, when we get data in from somewhere else, we will type check, like we will basically validate that the shape of the objects or these primitive data objects are, that we're getting matches what we're expecting. But it's certainly not throughout most of the application. It's really kind of on the edges. We were checking that like, are we getting this correct stuff in and are we sending the correct stuff out? And maybe on like library, like whatever surfaces we choose, we might introduce these, uh, use these libraries to you know, check the shapes of our, um, of our data. But yeah, there, there are some things that uh, you know, doing it comprehensively might be sometimes nice. But I think, yeah, enclosure and data-oriented or, programming is kind of saying, you know, type checking is nice, but it's also nice not to have to write types. And it's nice to just use the same functions with everything and not have to use a custom getter function for every different kind of object, et cetera. And, and the other thing that we kind of lose is encapsulation. So, you know, one of the big core concepts of object oriented programming is encapsulation. And by representing our data just as data and not behind, not inside of an object and with methods and stuff and getters and setters around it, um, we're basically tying the implementation of our data structures to the interface because it's the same thing. There is no there is no interface because the thing is itself, and um, so there is like basically no encapsulation. If something 
changes significantly, that change might you know, have to be propagated throughout the application. But um, I kind of might say that the opinion kind of, of data-oriented programming is encapsulations a little overhyped, overrated. And I think, you know, as a functional programming group, we might also be a little bit into that because like we have different ways of doing encapsulation. And part of that is, you know, uh, if you have parts of your code or parts of your application that uh, deal with your data as generic data, like for example, if I'm, you know, writing something like a map function or a reduce function, it doesn't really care what's inside other than it implements kind of the, you know, that it's a collection that it can, you know, uh, iterate over or something like that. Um, and so having generic data structures and generic functions that can operate on them is fine. And if, even if you were to make a change to the implementation of one of your, you know, data representations of things, the parts of your application that treat them as generic data aren't going to really get affected. So the encapsulation isn't like the loss of encapsulation isn't that big of a problem there. And in the cases where like, you know, you're actually uh, changing how you've implemented something, but you could have kept the same interface. I, I, I just like in practice, ten, like doing having written stuff for 10 years in Clojure, I don't feel like, I think it's very rare where we've changed the internal implementation of something and it's been a giant pain everywhere else because most of the functions that deal with those kinds of objects that, and like they care about like the domain of that object, like it, you know, this is a user object and this function works on user objects and no other types of user uh, data structures. Um, and in those cases, like you have that collection of functions that only work with those kinds of limited types of, uh, uh, data structures, they're all in one place anyway, in like in a namespace somewhere. So again, no, I don't, you know, we lose encapsulation, but I don't think it's a big deal in practice um, most of the time. And then there are some other little solo things like, yeah, sometimes performance can be an issue and some things might be hard to model. And I'll say that like data oriented programming might say, you know, we're not saying always, you know, only ever you, you know, <laughs> use these JSON like objects. It's okay if there's practical things that cause you not to. So yeah, if you're passing video streams around, you're not gonna wanna represent them in, as strings. Like, it, yeah, you can still have binary data. It's not, they're no longer plain, ob, plain data structures. Uh, it's no longer plain data, but that's fine. Like, it's more of like the idea of data orientedness is let's kind of start with the assumption that by default, we're gonna use these generic things, except for where it can't, um, but you know, choosing a different default is an important thing, like is, is or is relevant. Like, um, so me saying, let's default to this, but not do it whenever it becomes impractical, that is a very different thing than saying, let's default to typing and not type when it's not practical. And so, you know, can this kind of stuff work outside of closure? And, uh, you know, and I mentioned how, you know, in Ruby, there's really not much stopping you. Like there are hash maps in Ruby. Um, and in JavaScript, you know, you have the choice of using these plain JavaScript objects or using this whole like class data structure methods and like to this, these class type approaches. And I think there's quite a lot of languages that give you that choice of these like plain things that aren't typed and not, you know, uh, protected by a, an encapsulated object class instance, whatever. Um, you have that choice and different communities make different choices. And even in Clojure, we can we have the choice. We can do, we can create Java objects with, we can create protocols, we can do all this stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, most of those fundamental uh, types of things that we use in Clojure, like those hashes and collections and this, they're all objects and they're all Java objects under the hood. Um, but in our programs, we choose not to. Um, and so the kind of questions I was thinking about, like what makes this possible in other languages would be, you know, is there an easy way to create these things? In Clojure, all of that, everything kind of that I mentioned, we could do with literals. So there is a literal for, you know, hash maps, you know, all these keywords, vectors, lists, sets, dates, um, UUIDs, they're all, there are literal, there's literal syntax that we can do for creating these sorts of things. Um, are these, the other one is, are these data structures rich enough to actually model with? And I find that like, you know, JSON, you know, we have JSON APIs are everywhere now. And I think that's kind of an evidence of like, it's good enough 
because um, XML arguably is much, much uh, richer in terms of the kind of things that you can model with XML and JSON is a bit of a kind of less rich in its capabilities, but it's good enough. It, it reaches this kind of interesting balance. And so in Clojure, it's a, we have things that are slightly richer uh, than JavaScript. I, I would think that like, you know, in JavaScript, I would be slightly hindered by having to do uh, this kind of stuff because it's really nice to sometimes put an integer as a key and know that it's going to stay an integer. Um, so there are certain things that are kind of frustrating in some languages. And then thirdly there, it's, you know, is it actually easy to manipulate these data structures? Um, yeah, in Clojure, you have this giant standard library that assumes that like you're going to be working with these sorts of things and every single fundamental kind of primitive type in Clojure like implements a whole bunch of interfaces. So whether it's a hash map or various kind of alternative alternative implementation of hash maps or an array or a string, these are we can iterate over all of these. And so you can use map on hash maps, on uh, like the map function on hash maps, on strings, on lists, on vectors. Um, and you know mo most of these functions uh, can be used on a lot of different things. And there's value uh, in that. And if you don't, and again, I'll pick, I'm going to pick on, pick on JavaScript here, and why it's like hard to do these things, and why this isn't really, you know, or it's done but in a hobbled way. It's partly because like the JavaScript API, the standard API, doesn't really have a lot of like good functions for, you know, it has map, filter, reduce, but it doesn't have a ton of different things that people are used to in functional programming languages, like a partition function or, um, or zip mapping. Uh, and, and not only is like JavaScript, for example, limited, uh, it also like the, 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 the standard kind of library is quite limited. It also like is like a mixed bag of immutable and mutable functions, which for me, it drives me insane. Cause like I have a whole bunch of stuff I want to do with an arrays and half of the functions are going to mutate my array and half of them are going to return a new array. And unless I check the doc documentation, I don't know. And that is painful. Um, in Clojure, you have, you know, everything is immutable, everything. Um, you just kind of know by default what you're going to get, and that does simplify a lot of things. And the other kind of big thing that is important, I think, is the value semantics. Uh, so, for example, in Clojure, we can take, you know, we can generate two maps of things in, in, from two different sources, and we can compare them, or we can compare arrays, and they're actually compared based on their values, not whether they're the same object in memory. In some languages, you can't do that. You have to manually kind of you want to compare these two arrays, or you know, you're going to have to manually do a deep tree traversal to figure it out. And part of that again goes back to this idea of you know how, uh, in, in Clojure in particular, it's because Clojure implements all these things with immutable data structures, and so it gets some of those various wins in terms of comparisons because of that, because it's a lot easier to compare because you know uh, two immutable things or a thing. Uh, than it is a mutable, like a bunch of mutable objects. Um, so yeah, and I think you know, I, I'm a, like I've been talking about Ruby, JavaScript as my examples in Clojure because those are the ones that I'm exposed with. But I think it'd be interesting in the discussion uh, to kind of see like, yeah, you know, do you think we could do this in like your language of choice, or what would you have to be giving up, or what would be easy and what would be hard? And so we'll, we'll get to that because I'm almost done in part one. Just wanted to kind of bring back kind of this to this definition. Or my working definition at least is that like data oriented programming is around like choosing these like plain data, these generic primitive data structures, these kind of objects that aren't objects uh, because objects kind of are types. Um, they have you know, specific names, um, whether they have methods or not. So whether they're records or not, uh, it's choosing, even if it's available, choosing to use these kind of generic things because they're very flexible and by uh, having your entire application make use of them, it makes it much easier to then kind of just like mix and mash uh, and, and manipulate these with uh, the standard functions. All right, so that's that's my part one. And so my, my, my kind of question to kick off some discussion is, uh, what is, you know, what language are you working with? And like, is this even possible? Just out of curiosity, like, can you do this in F sharp? Like, can you represent things in F sharp without having to type them? Um, and or, you know, uh, yeah, would this be easy? Um, 
so that, that's 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 my kind of kickoff question. But you're also welcome uh, to, to we can kind of chat about. Uh, so I, get, I if I can jump in. Um, so uh, I mean, I'm I'm an F sharp user, and I, I do come from the other <laughs> the other side of the bench. Um, but so one of the things I like about uh, the type system, and I use the type system a lot, is for example, um, when I am refactoring code, right? So if I want to make a change somewhere in the code base to, um, you know, the uh, the contract, the data contract of a particular object, you know, I change it in the type, and then the compiler breaks everything and it says, okay, well, this isn't working, so fix this. So I go through, and it gives me sort of a way where I can effectively go through the code base and and you know, update the code so that I have some guarantees of it, you know, running with this new data contract. So I guess my question is, so first of all, like if you come into a, a closure code base that's maybe not written in the way, like not written using sort of this data-oriented programming, um, what changes would you make? Like, I mean, how would you, how would you change? What, what would you expect to see in a sort of non-data-oriented code base? And what changes would you make to, to get it into a, a data-oriented code base? And how do you manage things like, you know, making sure that at some point you aren't trying to, you know, add two strings together, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? Like the, the kinds of typical, when, when I think of JavaScript, you, 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 you think of like, sometimes JavaScript forgets that something's a number and it tries to do a string addition to two numbers or something like that. And there's all these sorts of weird errors that can come up. So, I mean, how do you avoid those sorts of data contract issues when you're trying to like refactor a code base? Sure. The, yeah, so there, I think there are three things there you mentioned. Uh, I'll kind of try to work backwards because I remember what they are. So, you know, I would say, you know, closure, that, that, that issue of like adding strings together accidentally, um, closure isn't uh, like, you know, there's kind of the side of, of like strong and weak typing versus static and dynamic. And so most things like closure would complain, like there aren't functions that are overloaded in that way in, in closure. Like we addition is separate from, is not the same function that's used for concatenation. Like addition is for numbers, uh, the stir function is for, for strings. Um, but yeah, it, it is possible to, at you know, um, write code that only at, you know when you run it at runtime it gives you a type error because it is kind of dynamic and so you, you're not getting these compile time uh, warnings and so that that first thing you mentioned like it's you know you, where you can like break something and then your compiler tells you every single location that is broken uh, that is nice and it is something that uh, we kind of lack um, the things that make up for that is testing, like having automated tests. Because, uh, you know, I think there are certain things that types still can't catch, right? Like, uh, or depending on the type system, there's things that are harder to represent. Like, you know, if you're implementing, you know, this is a trivial uh, uh, example and no one would really do this, but like if you're implementing your own reverse, uh, a type system might say, well, okay, I know that the incoming types are going to be the same as the outgoing types, but can your type system capture that it's going to have the same number of items and that they're actually going to be like, you know, you know re reverse. And so for certain things like that, like I feel like you still need to write tests, um, and we're and uh, tests will catch a lot of those kind of trivial errors. But the like knowing where we need to change things um, for certain uh, for certain changes certainly can be. Uh, can be an issue. And so the, what we lean on, I feel, is yeah, having reasonable coverage in our automated tests, plus also leaning on functional programming kind of makes it somewhat reasonably uh, easy to uh, follow through the program and, and know where things, where those types of things might end up. Um, it's not, yeah, but yeah, it is a legitimate trade-off in terms of like, yeah, it is certainly not as easy like it would take me a bit more time to identify for sure every single place that if I made a significant change to a piece of a data structure that it's not going to affect something else uh, that I put in. Um, but I, I guess the, the other question I had was kind of, if you come into a code base that mm -hmm. you want to like, you know, 
you want to sort of push into like a, a more data oriented programming paradigm i mean what what sort of changes do you typically you typically make i mean do you do yeah you it's like um, characters or like what's the the i think partly i think part of the, here is that like in closure almost everybody writes stuff in this kind of way um except for like you could you know you could type you could use records like closure allows you to create records and you could use write records throughout your entire application but if you showed that to a typical closure programmer they'd be like um cool you've used records but we kind of don't do that around here um like uh um and i'm not saying that like yeah that it's necessarily you know, better or worse i think data oriented you know, we uh, people who want to follow this kind of practice are making the choice of that in those trade-offs that they would prefer the benefits of you know using all the same functions on everything and having these kind of more generic objects and then introducing these kind of type checks but the more just like runtime shape checks sure. wherever we're worried about that kind of stuff um and so yeah i don't know uh like it's kind of more like this is me kind of just reporting on this is how we do things like this is how like people in closure land do things and it's just like it's been done for quite a while and a lot of code bases kind of just look this way so it's hard for me to specifically give a good example of like this is a case where i saw someone doing something like this and they're doing it different it's more of like people are doing things differently in other languages and so for example if i was in ruby and i saw a ruby code base the way i would write ruby a lot of ruby, like in the past when i was following ruby, ruby idioms I am doing trying to do idiomatic Ruby. Yeah, I would uh, like every single type of object that I would want in my system, I would create a class for it. And then I would have, you know, getters and setters. And, you know, there's a user object, there's a, uh, uh, you know, a company object. And somehow the, re the relationship between the users and companies is, is represented in one of those two objects, maybe. Um, whereas now I would just be like, no, it's a user is a hash map and it has an array of like company IDs. And companies are also hash maps, um, and you can do that in Ruby, right? And so if I had a Ruby code base, and I wanted for some reason to be like, okay, we're not doing Ruby idioms, we're doing closure idioms in, in in Ruby, then I would be like, okay, let's not like, do we need objects for all these things? It wouldn't it just be simpler to maybe just pass them around as a uh, generic hash maps? Cool. Thanks. So I have. Um, question or observation, mm -hmm. you know, so one of the points that you made, uh, I think maybe not on the slide, but just in passing was that, that you kind of find it like a pain in the butt to like write out the types, you know, it's like kind of like a lot of work. And, you know, for me, like that's definitely true of like Java and C sharp, you know, you got to create like a whole other file and You've got like directories with like, you know, 15 types for, you know, it gets kind of crazy, but, but then in like F sharp and Haskell certainly and um, OCaml and Scala, it's actually really easy to just very quickly, you know, like in a single line, write out new types or, you know, new objects, you know, that are um, uh, like, you know, really focused. And so I, I just wonder, I don't know anything about closure. So I don't know how hard it is to write out, you know, new classes in, in closure. Yeah, it can certainly be like part of the case, maybe, you know, the languages and the tools that we use shape the way we work with them. And, yeah. and, and it very well may be that like, you know, if closure made it dead easy um, to type things, then maybe people will be typing things more. Right. But I guess my, my, my return question on, on the trade-off is, is uh, do you like, can you map over uh, like, what do you have to do in order to like, if you're trying to make a list of like uh, new things and uh, or maybe like a, a and like say I was creating a new struct, can I ask for it's just like the keys of that struct or do you have to implement a method that uh, implements that? Like, so I think you would have to implement your own method, yeah. 
Um, even if you're I, just gonna, if, even if you're just gonna reuse like whatever's in the standard library, mm -hmm. you would still have to give a, a way to access it. Yeah. But it could be, I'm not saying like, cause I think, you know, uh, it might not be so bad. Cause like, I guess it's, it's maybe just like, you know, in whatever language they just, the standard interfaces for those things don't have, you know, don't implement, you know, keys um, on structs, but in theory they could, I don't know. Right. So it might, it, this might mm -hmm. still be okay. It really um, de depends. Um, yeah. And, and again, yeah, I think in some languages like Haskell and things like the tep type system is quite uh, flexible and easy and it might make that kind of trade off lesser. Right. And so that's why I think, you know, in Haskell, they don't do this as much because they don't have to. Um, right. This, this is sort of, um, reminding me that like this might be where type classes, you know, provide like a, um, an alternative to what you're talking about, like what, what you want. Um, and so what's while also class? giving you richer types, but, but also like common behavior. And can you, uh, can you just clarify what you mean by type classes? Yeah, so people are going to have to help me out. All the the more Haskellites here, <laughs> so so they're like they're interface ish kinds of things um, for uh, types themselves. You know, so they're sort of like types of types, um, and they they typically have you know they're they're modeling functionality. So if something if a certain type you know is a functor, then it has the the map method on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so and so that sounds like interfaces, kind of. Um, yeah, and so in closure, like you know, all of these, you know, all of these fundamental like hash maps and array, array uh, vectors and lists, yeah, they're implemented as Java objects, and they have interfaces, and they implement various interfaces, and so that's kind of how you get the functions being able to interoperate across so many of them is because mm -hmm. it just so happens that like the hash map. Uh, implements the same interface that an array does or a vector does in terms of its ability to like iterate over it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I guess the real thing is that uh, how easy would it be to kind of, uh, like if I wanted all the nice stuff of like the existing standard library of hash maps in theory in Clojure, I could like probably like fork or like subclass or basically take a hash map, mm -hmm. everything that's in a hash map and just call it my own thing and maybe add some restrictions to it. I, I could, mm -hmm. it sounds pain, like not painful, but it just sounds really weird for me to, to say that. But I guess that's kind of what you're kind of proposing potentially, like if you're creating your new types on the fly, you would just yeah. basically say like, this is a hash map and it contains these things inside of it. Um, and then we're yeah. just calling it a new thing now, like a hash map with numbers inside mm -hmm. of it that has a length of five. Yeah. Well, so, so, so another follow-up, and, and this is maybe like another, another question that I was wondering was that you, you did mention that you give up, um, you know, kind of validation stuff and, and uh, at least like maybe internally, you said you like pushing it out to the edges. And, and that was to me, like one of the more compelling reasons to use like really rich domain modeling is to, is to get like all the validation you know, in the domain and make sure you have, um, I mean, you can push it really far and, and try to make um, invalid states completely unrepresentable. Um, you know, so you, you have like a user uh, status, you know, the, the count status is like verified or unverified, you know, and that's it. It's not a string, you know, it's just. Yeah, it's an e like an enum or whatever. Yeah, it's like an enum, right, right. The so I guess I, I, the way that we do things in closure in the, or in, in, in like kind of uh, therefore also in like in data oriented programming is like we have kind of like optional typing, like we get to kind of just at runtime optional uh, stronger, like because these generic objects aren't types, but we can uh, use libraries that will check for whatever we want at runtime. So I do in my programs tend to then have a way of specking out that a user data structure has the following keys 
and these and their values have the following you know types um and i and because it's at runtime it's also possible to then say well you know this list has a following can can only be three things and these numbers can only be within this range and there's there's some things at runtime when you're doing kind of specs that are i think very easy to do that might i i don't even know if it's possible in some type systems like whether uh yeah um you know, like yeah like i can write a in my spec for a user i might say you know their email is a string and it follows this regex um and they're you know, and, and just also just give arbitrary run runtime functions for validating whatever data mm -hmm. i'm getting and so those we could put in wherever uh, like we could check and there are libraries that some people use that they kind of simulate uh this kind of um, typing everywhere where in they uh, there are libraries that kind of give you your own like function like instead of defining a function using the standard closure defin syntax mm -hmm. you're basically using a library that lets you put you know in uh, annotations on like what's coming in and what's coming out so that you get it in on that function and some people like to use that and use it throughout but in practice at least my understanding is that uh we kind of mo most shops and, and companies will just do it uh where they feel it's most necessary so for example if i was implementing an http api a web server i would definitely have all of my incoming data uh checked um mm -hmm. and perhaps if i was sending stuff out from, from that service or sending it to some other api I might do certain checks and so and then wherever i'm kind of worried about it uh or yeah. where, wherever it's particularly sensitive and it is possible in theory to take that all the way and every single function input and output is specced out and so like we call them specs mm -hmm. because they're, they're not really types they're they're runtime uh validations uh but in practice i don't think everybody people aren't doing it everywhere um i see because okay. like you know for some code it's like you can kind of see uh uh you know you see that you know it's gonna be it's you see that it's correct and any changes that you make you can trivially know that um they're gonna break this or not break it and a lot of code like is generic and it, so it doesn't care because it can't really break or not break but the stuff that is domain specific sometimes might break or not break but i don't know um mm -hmm. i guess the it, it is a trade-off again i'm saying these are trade-offs mm -hmm. uh and then just like it just so happens i think that in our community people are willing to uh take the trade-off of uh, so, so, so let me jump in here real real quick um and i don't want to um distract too much because you have a whole nother part of your talk you want to yeah. get to um and, and um i i think i might want to come back to the, um some of what i'm saying later at, at the end of the talk because uh, i've been thinking about this for a while but but um part of what i think is going on here is in this sort of constant dynamically typed versus statically typed debate is in 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 the social sciences research uh, community that i'm part of um there, there's a classic uh now I think it's a classic text um, called The Tale of Two Cultures that talks about qualitative research versus quantitative research. And basically what they argue is there are two fundamentally different logics going on and everyone's talking past each other mm. in, in the debate. And so when you're critiquing um, static typing, I think what's going on, and, and, and I, I hear it in, in what you're saying, but in general, when sort of dynamically oriented people are, are critiquing critiquing static typing, what they're critiquing is sort of mediocre static typing. And, and I don't think, so like Java or Python, which isn't static typing, but it, Python has this weird, it's dynamic, but it's strongly typed and you get into these weird, annoying issues. Whereas those critiques don't seem to resonate at all for fancy type systems like the MLs and Haskell have. And um, conversely, I, I, I see it on the other side of um, 
sort of statically type people or uh, especially people from who are working with fancy type systems don't seem to appreciate what dynamic like real good dynamically typed systems can do and part of what i hear you saying is sort of let's push away from sort of this sort of in the middle dynamically typed system um more towards sort of like untyped and minimize the types as much as possible and i i think and and i'm very sympathetic towards that because and i've talked about this a little bit um or a fair amount <laughs> in this group is the two languages that i use the most now are uh tcl which is untyped um and ocaml which is fancy typed and um i've found sort of going to those extremes to be really really useful and in tcl it's not that everything's a hash map it's everything's a list and then you're just passing lists around in the same way that you're talking about i, I think in the same way that you're talking about passing hash maps around as, as far as i know T T tcl is almost a lisp right like um or I or it has like heritage there. But yeah, it's the same, like effectively a hash map is a list of keys and values. It just has that constraint that there's, you know, pairs of things. Um, yeah, the, you know, and, and I think you're right. I, I, um, I, I wish, and, and something that perhaps, you know, I'll try to write down if I ever give this, try to give this again is, you know, there is an effort in closure to have a, what's called typed closure. Um, where someone has gone through and basically kind of forked the language so that you could use kind of uh, kind of try to introduce a slightly fancier type system. But as far as I know, they were running into like some significant limitations around the way that certain functions work that would make it really hard. And it might just be a question of effort because like I, I, I've heard a story and I don't know how correct it is because like Haskell has this idea of lenses and the lenses library is amazing but apparently like 90 percent of the effort of that was trying to make it possible to do lenses in a within the type system of haskell um whereas this idea of like the way that lenses work would be much more trivial in a kind of dynamic system so i don't know but yeah uh it it, it for sure like i think having fancy type systems makes this kind of trade-off less worth uh, kind of more in the favor of, yeah, like these type systems don't get in the way so much. And we, I am probably, you know, I'm picking on the shitty ones, but in practice, like a lot of commonly used languages have these shitty ones. Um, cool. Yeah. So let me, let me get into part two. Um, Cause uh, you know, it'll probably take another similar amount of time and then we'll have, we'll chat again. All righty. So let's move on to data driven programming. And um, I mentioned, let's say, if we go back, uh, my quick definition, I don't have a site for this, for data-driven programming was using, preferring kind of these plain data. So we're still sticking with this idea of like plain data and preferring and finding ways of using that instead of writing code. Um, so like less code if, uh, and more of the static data. Um, and we'll kind of see what that means. But, if you kind of know this idea of like metaprogramming of like using, you know, uh, metadata around the various objects that we might have in our program to then conditionally do different things, this is similar except instead of using like objects and, and metadata facilities, they're just data structures. And so you can just ask them what's inside. Um, but let's kind of, uh, I'll kind of get into it more formally here. And so modern programming, I'd say is uh, rife with this idea of like domain specific languages and, you know, language, you know, there are domain specific languages that you know, exist externally. So something like SQL, right, uh, isn't necessarily embedded in your program. It's just a language that's really just meant to talk to databases. And there are a lot of these other languages that, you know, uh, aren't general programming languages. They're probably, they might not even be Turing complete. Um, and they have usefulness. I'm going to be talking more specifically about like embedded ones. So these are languages that are within other languages, um, or just like libraries that are effectively their own languages within a language. 
So I'm kind of I'm calling these embedded DSLs. You know, and they you know they solve some specific kind of more well-defined problem that you know more specific than it's turn complete and I can do anything in loops and ifs and whatever. So something more, more specific than that. So the domain is limited. And so they tend to be more declarative, although you know, the more I think about what de declarative versus non-declarative, I kind of lose meaning. I did a talk last year about declarative or trying to explain declarative programming. And by the end of it, I just, lo it lost all meaning and like I couldn't distinguish it like anymore. I feel like it's a kind of an arbitrary distinction of like what versus how. Um, anyway, but yeah, they tend to kind of be what we've called declarative, uh, not too incomplete. Uh, versus you know general programming languages, and so with these embedded DSLs, you know the the most common one that exists in I think every language is, is a regex system, and so within your language you can call into a regex system to run a regex, and you know that was a well designed and very common you know a well designed interface, a well designed uh, a common problem, and so everybody kind of has access to it and, and it's very common. But there's a lot of other ones that are you know, less so. And so some examples here are like, so this idea of JSX, which was you know, the React team, I think, in trying to be like, okay, we want to represent, we want to do templating. And so we want to do like intermix HTML and JavaScript. So we're basically going to create a superset of the JavaScript language that lets us intermix HTML and JavaScript um, and effectively creating a whole new domain specific like little sub like if we looked at the html parts of jsx versus the javascript parts the html parts are kind of the domain specific language that's kind of embedded in javascript most of rails and uh, and a lot of ruby libraries could be are, are, are actually uh, domain specific languages um, and in particular like you know various parts of rails like how they do their routing system you're basically like, using objects in weird ways to represent something that eventually become like tells what tells the Rails routing system what to do. In Clojure, there's a library called Core Async that effectively implements like Go loops from Go, completely changing the behavior of the, inter like anything that you put inside of a Clojure, a Core Async Go block operates on a com like completely different runtime. And so most DSLs, like when I think of DSLs, effectively they're, they're giving you a new interface into a different runtime than the, other, and then and then any other, than some other language you know your your f sharp the vm has some behavior and you have some ways of interacting and, and controlling that behavior and then you might have a dsl that offers you kind of a little sub universe of a slightly different vm that you can kind of program slightly differently and i think with kind of the bargain of dsls is that you get potentially like much more power um, you can do things, you know, if you think of a regex, the amount of like, if you had to implement what a regex typically, you know, a, a pretty simple regex is doing in regular code, it would be quite a lot of code. Um, and so they give you that power and often at the cost of like more complexity and the complexity primarily comes from, well, now you might have like, uh, now you have like two VMs, like there's different parts of the code that are interacting and in, in the case of regex they they overcome that because there's a very clean interface regex the regex system of most languages is kind of just like a function call you know all you say is here's some text here's this pattern give me a reply back but that's not true of a lot of other dsls where it's kind of more like a, you know uh, jsx is it's all interleaved um i was talking about this core async basically you have a completely different runtime behavior that you can embed in any parts of your program. And so they, so there's a potential for introducing much more complexity unless you limit the expressiveness. And so, you know, regexes provide a clean interface, but also have a very limited set of things that you can express. And so I think um, part of the trick of like getting your kind of cake and eating it too in terms of DSLs is uh, giving you more power, but limiting the expression and, and what you can do with it so that it's not just like an explosion of complexity of like, well, now I can just do so many things and they can inter interact in so many different ways. Um, so it's kind of just like some uh, abstract thinking about like what, you know, DSLs are. And so uh, in terms of like the ways that you might create a DSL and an embedded one specifically, uh, you know, most 
people, if they're trying to solve a problem that they think that they could solve by creating a new language, reach to creating a new text grammar, like effectively just like straight up, let's write a new language. In the JSX example, they couldn't modify JavaScript to do what it can do because they wanted to introduce new syntax. So they had to write a new compiler that was a superset that handled a superset of the JavaScript language. And in the case of you know, SQL, they didn't use anything else. It's just, it's its own language. Now from a, you know, how it might interoperate in, a, like if we we're writing, trying to write SQL from within, let's say JavaScript or whatever other language, one way then to interact with this is then to just kind of drop into basically text. Like this is a common way of interacting with SQL databases is that like at some point you're just like dropping strings of SQL. And occasionally there might be some pattern matching and or some way of like putting holes in that can be replaced like in this case. Uh, but effectively it's like, yeah, like we're just gonna create either create a completely new language. Well, we are gonna create a completely new language. It's gonna be parsed as text. And the way to interact with it is through a completely separate compiler or through just passing text to some external system. Um, another way though, uh, that's common in some object oriented languages is something called like fluent APIs. And that's basically like you're creating a, a sub language that's making use as much as possible of existing things in the, in the, in the, in the current language. So you're using like functions or in the case of most fluent APIs, you're using various objects and methods on those objects and you can chain those objects. And at the end of the day, it creates some internal object hierarchy representation of the thing that you're doing. So this is some library called Requel. I think it's, it's, it's JavaScript also that lets you represent that same text-based query by, um, concat by, by, by doing a whole bunch of like method calls um, with various parameters. And, you know, and why is this any better? And like part of the argument for why this is better is because if you wanted to like compose and if you wanted to create this kind of query on the fly um, and have you know, if statements and for loops or like basically like do anything at runtime and, and generate this kind of query, if you only have a text-based system, you're basically resorting to string manipulation and you can really easily shoot yourself on the foot and you basically have to understand the full semantics of the language and whatever kind of thing that you're creating. And if you have this kind of fluent API, it tends to make it easier. Like I didn't have to, you know, uh, I could have represented, um, let's see if I can doodle here. You know, I could have had everything up to this point saved into a variable and then later given some conditional add this line, add this part to it. Usually this, these fluent API is gonna work in that way. And so that composability, that generatability is, is quite nice. But I do agree, like sometimes looking at these systems, it is a, like, I would much prefer just to like, this seems much simpler to me. This seems like kind of painful, um, but maybe it's just, you know, the familiarity of SQL versus having to like re-implement SQL in like some language. Sometimes it's very awkward. So another way, and this is common in like in the languages that have strong macro systems is macro-based uh, DSLs. And I think, you know, these two ideas are very similar. Um, it's just kind of like, if you have objects, this is how it looks like. And if you have macros, this is how it kind of looks like. Um, and so in a lot of Lisps, these kind of APIs might be, uh, or DSLs are, are popular. It's trying to make certain things easier and trying to make it, you know, not having to resort to doing string concatenation. But the challenge with macros is that uh, they're kind of opaque. Um, when I get the thing that I get from this and the stuff that I'm passing to it, it's just like, it's, it's hard to, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of poke and, and inspect it. Like I know that I have a select statement, but once I get this thing, is there a way for me to, uh, you know, ask things of it? And very often it's not because like the internal representation is just some, you know, uh, uh, opaque thing. Uh, and so this, this, we're kind of now getting to this idea of data-driven DSLs. And so the big idea here is, I'm just gonna move this to the corner. Um, let's just use plain data structures as our interfaces into any of these kind of DSL VM VMs. So rather than 
uh, using text rather than using objects and chained, chained method calls, or rather than using macros, why not represent whatever we want uh, using plain data structures and pass those off to the system? And the reason that this is quite nice and like why kind of, I, I call the top three, that's kind of like various forms of code. Here's a completely new language that you know, we're representing as a string because that's the only way we can do it in, in our language. But these are just like, the, the top three are like code. The bottom one I distinguish as data because it has very different characteristics. And so it's worth kind of distinguishing it. Like, yes, this you know, data exists within code, but if we're just talking about these like plain data structures, um, you know, they have, properties that code doesn't have and like partly they're like transparent they are just what they are this is a hash map with keys and values it in enclosure it has no behavior because it's immutable so this thing is just what it is it's it's kind of like a number it's just like in terms of like numbers are just values this is just a more complex value uh, but it has no behavior it is what it is and it is trivial to manipulate I could insert, remove things. I can generate this uh, very, very easily if I wanted to at runtime from composing it from various kind of subparts. Uh, super, super easy uh, to kind of manipulate this kind of stuff. It's also easy to kind of serialize, pull this in if you need to save these sorts of things somewhere or from a config file or to the database. Um, trivial to inspect in terms of like, if I wanted to, again, ask for the keys, for the values of these things, or what are our, how many joins am I doing in this query? The data just is there and you can do whatever you want with it. You can ask whatever you want of it. And then it's also pretty easy to, you know, it, it's, it, it, you can write pretty complex specs. Um, and, you know, I talk about specs in terms of versus types, but you can, you know, conditionally check whatever you want, whether like, oh, I want to check that this join only has two joins um, because for whatever reason, or um, any order sort of like any question you can ask about this data structure, you could write a function to kind of ask it. And that probably would not be as trivial to do with um, the kind of the top three approaches. Uh, um, so, you know, there are some trade-offs though. And again, so this is, so the, the big idea here is that, yeah, like why don't we just use data structures as our interface to these external systems or even internal kind of DSL systems? Um, bunch of benefits to doing that. Uh, but some of the trade-offs is that occasionally it can be more verbose, right? Like usually the most terse representation would be a full custom language and having to kind of su pseudo represent something within the constraints of an existing language is sometimes hard. Um, uh, if you're parsing things at runtime versus compile time, there, there occasionally are like performance issues. And we'll, I'll talk more specifically about that in a moment. And, you know, and some things are Turing complete by nature. And so like, if you have a VM that is Turing complete, then you probably want a Turing complete language to work with it instead of like something less than that. And so my key example of like a bad, design choice in my opinion is Ansible. And that's why I was, I mentioned it earlier uh, when we were chatting at the beginning, because like Ansible made this choice of, okay, we're gonna have um, uh, idempotent functions, which I think is awesome. So, you know, once you run a function on the server, if you run it multiple times, you're still gonna get the same result, awesome. But then they also conflated that with having it to use a declarative data using YAML, they used YAML as their language. And I argue that Ansible is not like, it's using declarative syntax, but in practice, you're still writing like an imperative, like do this, then do this, then do this. Cause like deploying a system involves multiple steps and they have to be in order. And so really like it deserves uh, an actual language. And I think using YAML as the syntax to what's effectively a, you know, Turing complete language is a giant pain. Um, so that's my little rant on uh, inappropriate uses of, of declarative uh, data structures. But in many other systems, it is, it is, I think, a practical and a good, good, good approach. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of examples in like the closure ecosystem. And 
you know, in closure, you can represent regex as kind of using the regular PCRE text syntax, but if you, but there was, there is a library called Regal that lets you represent them using data structures. And if you need to dynamically generate regexes on the fly, it's much easier to work uh, with composing things with something that looks like this um, than, uh, than this, than using string, string manipulation. Uh, in the problem of let's say routing, so this is like writing an HTTP web server, for many years, the most popular library in Clojure was called Composure and it used macros as its primary kind of interface. But basically once you wrote um, this, you composed kind of your code here, it effectively just like, you know, all of these things here were macros and it just gives you back a blob and you can't do anything with that blob other than just say, well, run it. It's completely opaque, you can't, um, and, and it's effectively like, it's very hard to like generate. Like if you wanted to dynamically generate a server based on some configuration somewhere, it was basically impossible to do it uh, um, uh, or, or hard to do it with, with these kind of macros. And so for the last few years, uh, there's been a bunch of libraries, but one of the more popular ones does this now in a data oriented way where you represent your entire HTTP API as a data structure um, and the underlying kind of library um, converts that into an HTTP server. But by being a data structure, it's possible to like, you know, you can put if statements or for loops or whatever to in here, or you can mishmash, you know, one schema with another schema. And like you, you have this complete freedom of generating what needs to be passed to this library. Uh, you know, I'll go, come back to this idea of UI templating. So, you know, we talked about JSX, which is how, you know, you do things in React, but in Clojure, most uh, templating langu languages just use Clojure data structures. So arrays of keywords and strings and, uh, and hashes as a way of representing HTML. And by doing so, it becomes trivial to just like introduce, you know, for loops or if statements, whereas in kind of this language approach, like there's a lot of weird mangling of like doing maps and having to only, you can't use if statements, you can only use um, ternary expressions. And it's just, yeah, it, 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 it feels a little janky. Whereas here you're just like, I'm just, gener I'm just manipulating data structures or generating data structures to do what I want. And then my library is taking those in and, um, and doing what it does. So it's just like, it's, it's nice. It's a nice interface. I said, the point here is like data-driven is using data as an interface is awesome. Like, and simple, stupid data is awesome. Uh, Cause it's trivial to generate, trivial to manipulate. Um, a few more examples, styling, you know, uh, you know, CSS is its own language. And then when people tried to improve CSS, they created a whole bunch of other kind of languages. And one of them is SCSS and it's, it's its own language um, in Clojure. Some people, they, they were just like, okay, let's just represent CSS using Clojure data structures and manipulate it then into CSS. And again, it's, you know, I, in, in, in this, in, in, in SCSS, they had to introduce a compiler concept of mix-ins, which let you like reuse styles. Whereas in Clojure, by doing it this way, the, li the library author didn't have to do anything because you can just compose functions. You can just have one function return a subset of this data structure that you want to reuse. Uh, and even like, you know, graph querying, GraphQL, its own full language. I feel like they could have done this using JavaScript objects, but they chose not to for whatever reason. And uh, in Clojure, there's this idea of, there's this library called EQL or this spec a specification called EQL, which describes effectively the same thing as GraphQL, but using data structures so that you can uh, generate it on the fly if you need to um, and manipulate it in whatever way you want. And, you know, I talked about specs before. In Clojure, there was a part of the Clojure language itself where they were introducing ideas of like how to write specs and they did it with macros. And it became the, the main challenge, I think there that some people didn't like was that one, they were not very, it wasn't easy to introspect 
and generate, but also it wasn't easy to like store, like serialize in any way. And so there's a growing movement of using, like there's this library that for example, we use called Molly, which just again, lets you use data structures to represent the same things. And then, um, you know, does the same stuff under the hood. Like at the end of the day, I get the same out of it in terms of I can have functions that I can use to validate data anywhere in my application. But this kind of interface is much more flexible. Um, and, you know, and, and there are ways you don't have to go like full sale data. So here's an example of something we did in one of our applications where we wanted to define this concept of pages. Um, and so we just kind of came up with some data structures that represent our pages. And then we generate the underlying kind of like HTTP endpoints and the various like front end infrastructure that needs to deal with different pages and, 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 and link them. Uh, and it's just, you know, the, and these aren't like pure plain data. There are functions kind of sneaking in here. And so um, this isn't like, you know, uh, this is kind of taking a more practical approach where we're still mixing in some stuff. Like I couldn't easily serialize this, but it's still kind of a similar concept. Um, we had this like routing, like our own little like super simple uh, routing uh, system that just had, you know, an array of arrays and, you know, you describe like a get and you pass a function and then you have a list of middleware. Uh, so this is kind of somewhat data oriented apart from those kind of functions sneaking in there. If I wanted to make this purely data oriented instead of a function, I would put like a, an ID, some keyword that references a function to find somewhere else. But in our cases, it wasn't a big deal. And then we also, there's this library that I wrote called Tada. And it allows you to write these effectively super functions that include various, you know, preconditions and parameter checks uh, and separate side effects. And by splitting it out, uh, rather than having it just all within a function, we can then use this data to generate the routing system and like the HTTP API, but as well as potentially like we've done it where we, we use the same data to deploy to AWS Lambda. Um, so by having data in a very declarative way, like having these things written in a declarative way, we can then manipulate it and for different purposes, you know, um, send it to uh, AWS Lambda or implement it in a more traditional uh, Java web server. And so taking this idea kind of to the extreme, I kind of like, I, I often now think of or, or the applications as I write as a collection of sub problems and like little sub engines, you know, there's the routing engine, there's the page management engine, there's like all these different like little sub problems in my application that have interfaces to them. And a lot of those interfaces are just using data. And then I can have some source of truth data that I use to then, I, I have some sources of truth, maybe some schema, some data representing all the different types of things that are in my system. I then manipulate that because it's data, I can manipulate it trivially and massage it into what my various kind of uh, sub engines expect. And so that's kind of what I see some of our, like that's what I have in my head in the, some of the things that I try to architect um, is that basically we have some data structures that represent our, our data model and then we manipulate them into whatever our libraries need. And hopefully our libraries are written in a, uh, except just like in a data structures. And this is kind of like meta programming, right? It's, it's effectively meta programming you're using uh, you're manipulating some code to represent to generate other code, except it's not really metaprogramming because it's not code generating code. It's data being used to generate code. Um, and I'll leave with my kind of final example, uh, my favorite example of this, uh, which is AWS was in a situation where they needed to like you know release libraries for all the different kind of you know they wanted to have a Ruby library, the Go library, PHP library, JavaScript library, Java library. Yeah. They didn't write their closure library, but we'll get there. Um, and you know, writing all of those libraries to interact with AW, their AWS system could be a giant pain. And so what they did was they represented every single endpoint in their in AWS with JSON um, in a declarative way, and then they just generated all those libraries. Or they're or you know wrote some little lib a you know, little bit of Ruby that then generates the rest of the Ruby library, or a little bit of Java that effectively generates the rest of the like a full um, 
REST library. And so the folks at Clojure, uh, one of the teams, uh, like the core Clojure team, or Cognitech, which is the company behind Clojure, took advantage of the same set of data to create the Clojure, to create a Clojure library to interact with AWS. And so, that, so I thought that, that was pretty cool, a pretty powerful way of like not having to write 10 libraries, instead represent data in one place and then generate 10, 10 different libraries in 10 different languages. Yeah, so effectively JSON being used to generate 10 libraries, different libraries. Okay, and so that, that's, my, that's my bit for there and kind of bringing back, you know, so data drivenness is this kind of choice of, you know, if there are situations where we can represent things just as data or like static data structures, then that's probably preferable because you know, data is much simpler and easier to manipulate and compose and generate than code is. And I think this is where like, I would even say, you know, in terms of how to apply this to other languages, the generic part is not what's important here. It's using uh, data structures that don't have behavior that are much simpler than you know, methods, functions, objects, all that kind of stuff, and using those to generate other, um, generate the actual stuff. Um, so, being, so introducing simplicity to the application by trying to move as much as possible into these like simple representations that don't have behavior and then generate behavior from them. All right, um, time for questions. You have a few minutes. I'm, I'm willing to stick around for as long as people are. Um... Yeah, so I wanna thank you. This, this was really interesting. Um, I, I, no, thank you very, very much because I've been, um, hearing about data-oriented programming and trying to understand it. And now I feel like I finally have a better understanding of it. Um, and I've got a bunch of questions, but I wanna open it up to other people first. Um, so have at it. I just wanted to say, I really like the, uh, the data-driven, the DSLs you were building out of, um, uh, just basically arrays and, and objects and things like that. I think that's definitely seemed like one of the powers of the non-type system where, um, or one of the challenges I would have writing that in F sharp, it would be like, I'd have to make sure that all the types are correct as you put them in. And I don't have any, like, don't have that much flexibility. I mean, I guess I could use like uh, a hash map or something like that, but that has its own issues. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it definitely is, is nice that, um, the DSLs that you were writing were very extensible because of the fact that they weren't there weren't like any prescriptions on what types were allowed in the in this box. So I like that. Really cool. Yeah, and I think you know, um, I think this might you know this is why like these two are related, right? Because this data drivenness is enabled by this like data oriented practice, right? And so like I don't think the two necessarily exist. I mean, I think they could exist separately, but they, the reason they do in Clojure both exist is because they're, they are so related. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, it, it's so trivial to create, you know, to write these literals that it is a better way. It is, it is just, and, and so trivial to manipulate them and, and compose them that it just becomes like, yeah, the, 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 the better way. But I do think that even in, yeah, I, I'm curious. Yeah, like so, you know, in F sharp, like, do you think you could do this? And, and if it inspires you to think about, like, how could you do this? Then, then my job here, I guess, is done. Um, there are different ways of handling things in F sharp. So F sharp, you do have to kind of, um, you probably have to sort of map out. Still have to kind of map out the domain of your language. You can do a lot using like generics. Um, so just sort of that sort of. Uh, parameterization of the inputs. Um, you don't have the sort of freedom that you do in, in Clojure. Uh, you know, typically when I have a issue like that, I, I use something called a, F-sharp has something called a computation expression, which is uh, it's sugar for monads, but it's really just a nice way of kind of creating DSLs like that without all the ceremony and without making things kind of ugly as you were pointing out before. Um, and, and there are certainly ways of making those classes uh, extensible in, in the way that, that you're talking about, but I think they also run into the issues that you were talking about, especially where, well, the same kind of issues with macros is it's hard to document a fairly open language, 
like a, D, a fairly open DSL where it's sort of like you can do a whole lot of things in it, but you, it's hard for me to say like, okay, well, you could do this, but don't do this because it'll break it or you know something like that. You, you run into a lot of frustration where since you're creating a different language inside of the one that people are presumably familiar with, um, it's hard for them to, they get frustrated when they try to do things they would expect. They should be able to do, but they can't because of the strict restrictions on the macros or the computation expression. So yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in um, with one of my questions. Um, so on these DSLs, I, I was trying to understand something. Um, so like in the Honey SQL um, example, where you've got, you know, a select and a from and a join, is that hash map being read by a separate function that then is understanding what to do with the select and what to do with a from and what to do with a join or is it that there is a that that select is defined as a function within honey sql um I was, I was muted, sorry. Um, right, okay, so uh, in, in this case, Honey SQL is just uh, converting this data structure to SQL. And, and maybe under the hood, like it depends on how, like it might not be using text because like there's binary representations of, of these things and, and, and how to you know, talk to Postgres, but it, it's, it still has to talk to Postgres. Um, and so perhaps this isn't, uh, you know, if, if, it, if, if we didn't have SQL, would we, is there a different way that we could write like a relational database uh, DSL if we're using data structures? Probably. So this is still like confined within the world of it has to be kind of, it, it has to eventually end up being SQL. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and a, if I, yeah, so, like, like, uh, so that's why you know, this thing has no meaning other than the data structure and then the library converts this to something that kind of looks like this. Um, but we could have had something, you know, a, a much more different DSL here because uh, the, you know, if I were to compare for the, the routing ones, uh, let me go to the, oh, somehow I have done a bunch of keyboard shortcuts and now I have circles, okay. Um, so the routing one, uh, in this case, like rate it um, has this nesting and destructuring and it can get quite kind of fancy. Um, whereas like our, the one that, you know, I wrote in an afternoon um, or less uh, is linear. And so it's a, it's a different way of representing like the input into the system. And my, our, this one is much less powerful and it's doing much less under the hood. Um, and so the same thing I would say for the SQL one is like that SQL one, uh, it's still just basically converting it to SQL, but maybe we could imagine, you know, if, it, if we were starting, if I was designing a new relational database system and I had to choose between an interface to it, I might not, and, and I was choosing data structures, I might not end up with this because there might be a nicer, even nicer way of representing relational data queries than this. Um, and partly kind of like graph queries are kind of like that. If we go to the graph query example, this is a query that basically says from the actor table, pull in actors, join on films, and for those films, get their film title. And it's But in like these cases, open. there's a separate function that, that understands that structure. Yes, yeah, yeah. They're like this is just like, this is an input to that function. So, so, so the reason I'm asking you this um, is uh, going back to my TCL experience. So one of the things that um, we do in TCL, and, and I did this just a few weeks ago, and like, it was amazing, um, is 
you can, because the language is so flexible, you can essentially like on, on that select from join. So you have your data structure, but then you write functions named select from join that then actually do what you need to do. And then you can just shove your entire data structure into a loop and just sort of process through it and generate your output. So I, I had to present um, at a conference um, and, and I've, I've got this project basically on measurement. And there are uh, two concepts that I call sort of a concept versus a measure, right? It's all about sort of operationalization and how do you measure stuff. And a concept has certain dimensions, a measure has certain dimensions. And so I had those all sort of written out um, in pseudocode um, in a document for, for this way of measuring. We've talked about this in, in the group before, measuring prairie, measuring prairie style homes. And then like I basically had an afternoon <laughs> to like generate this massive like visualization. And so I wrote a little bit of tickle code that um, basically sort of loaded up. I, I wrote a function for concept and I wrote a function for measure that then generated GraphViz code to sort of generate everything. And, and that sounds, it sounds like another step, it, I guess, in, in what you're talking about. It's, a, it's all sort of linked together, but then I could I can shove the data structure anywhere I want. So I can generate data from it. I can generate a, a figure from it, all reading the same structure. Does that make some sense? Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, all of these examples are just showing kind of like, yeah, the input into the, the, into the actual thing, right? Because like when we think of a regex, you know, you know, there, you know, we have a, we have the input to the regex function, but there's still like the machinery of the regex function. And regexes are, you know, fairly simple compared to some of these other things, but they're still fairly complex. There's still a lot of stuff going on when you tell a regex to to run. And so, just like you were saying, like yeah, um, in in this case, like you can apply this kind of data driven style if you're designing a library, but you can also just do it in your own code. It's just like it's choosing to separate. I, instead of having everything just as code, I'm going to rip out a bunch of stuff into just data structures that don't have any behavior and then, you know, parse those data structures to generate behavior. Kind of like you were saying, like you can reuse them in various ways. You can recombine them. Just this idea that like co uh, data is simpler. And even if it's typed structs or objects that don't have methods, like all those things are kind of unambiguously simpler than uh, you know, uh, a function and code and like a full like, you know, that where stuff is going on. And there are opportunities in a lot of situations kind of like you're, in, in your case where you can extract stuff into data, you can kind of refactor, you can extract it into data and, um, and then have something more maybe complicated slightly more complicated code that like loops over that data and slightly parses it and, 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 and does the behavior. And any other questions before I um, stop the recording? Because I have things to say after we stop the recording too that aren't fit for public consumption. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now then. <laughs>